six i think chapter 26 and as i said the discussion is about the structure and constitution of a world state because the world state if it is going to be formed it will follow the same steps as the formation of nation unit and subsequent formation of the nation state nation is executing all its collective functions through this state well the human unity or unity of mankind if it becomes real it has two alternatives they lose organic union of world nations or you know federation of nations and another is a world state organized properly as the states are organized in nations well, out of this possibility he is working out the one possibility pursuing the idea of world state if it came what it would require and what it would become like because unless until we have some idea of the form that it is likely to take we will always uh, you know get confused about uh, uh, about the the outcome which sh we should wish what is it that we should vote for or will for unless we know you see what is what is the kind of union of the world that we envisage or we require or we feel is desirable this is important this prognostic is not merely a discussion on uh, speculation only this uh, is only dealing with possibility and there are always in a situation given either for a nation or for an individual there are number of possibilities that open out when a question arises about the future future is not one decided or determined line of evolution it is always left open 3 4 5 10 hundreds of possibilities and out of that well the human consciousness selects or mind selects 1 2 3 4 like that and pursues it now here he is trying to show two big possibilities which according to all thought seems to be uh, what must come a world state or an organic union or federation of free nations now out of them what we, what is possible so he is pursuing the world state idea to the logical limit and showing if it became a world state it would require military centralization economic centralization and now today he is dealing with the idea of administrative centralization as to how the administrative centralization will have to be made and gone through and what would be its consequences then we compare with this idea an organic union of peoples of the world not nations and states organized but peoples of the world well if we and we say that, then we would see how it has to come about. That is another possibility, how that has to come about. And what factors are required to bring it about. What necessitates the bringing about of these. And if these came, what the nations will have to undergo as changes, what collective life of man will become like and so on. All the possibilities are being discussed here. And it is with a view to make our human intellect, intellect and will decide about the course of the future by our decision and selection you see now administrative unity the idea generally is a centralized world state when it comes to power people think now that it would only prevent war and do no more now this is a idea is an idea to begin with is all right but anybody who knows this centralizing tendency in its ultimate you know destiny will at once understand that it may start with preventing war, but it will go on centralizing more and more power. This is the law. Once centralization starts and you say, no, we give centralized power to the world state in order to prevent war. Quite right. War may be prevented, but the centralizing of power will not stop with only prevention of war. That is one idea he is making out. And the general idea is that nations would be left quite free each other and uh, only war would be prevented that would be chief function now that is in one sense quite right but uh, the idea would not come true in actuality or in practice because more and more centralization would take place because weak nations would want that they must be protected by that bigger nations would want more centralization to impose their policy upon the whole world so both the weak and the stronger nations would contribute to make it stronger, more centralized, you see. 
You follow the logic, it's very simple. Once the weaker nations would always want that the you see, world state must do something to, to set right their injustices or their claims. The stronger nations would want more power at the world state stage in order to dictate and you know, bring about their policy in the world politics, you see. So the tendency to centralization would not decrease. It would not stop with prevention of war. That's it. That's one. <clears throat> And uh, national barriers can prove a great obstacle against this state idea. The idea of nationality and each nation trying to be preserving its own, you know, not only existence, but its freedom and its uh, right to, to do whatever it likes. Now, this is now limited by many considerations today. Nations are not... Uh, quite uh, sovereign as they would be, as that would have been 40 years back even. You see, even in 30 years, if such a change has taken place, the nations are not feeling sovereign. Just to do what they like, declare war whenever they like and stop war whenever they like, that idea is gone, that time is gone. Because, he says, science militates against it. Because science is not national, science is universal, international. So national barriers are first broken by this impact of science being international. So thought is international. A thought about uh, self-determinist nations, whether weaker nations have a right or not. Well, about this, the thought is not confined to one nation. It becomes international immediately. Nonviolence as a means for settling international dispute. Now, this is past barriers of nation. So the, the op opposition of national existence to a world state will have a tendency to be limited and reduced by the two or three factors, the international character of science, the character of thought, which is also universal and impersonal, character of religious impulse. Religious impulse everywhere is the same, that there is a divine and man is a, man is a soul. And you see, these concepts, apart from all religious differences, are common. So that also takes away the sharpness of national consciousness and egoism of national consciousness and the tendency to maintain national rights against the international organization of a world state. That's two. <laughs> so legislative function ultimately will have to come to the world state. Just as in a nation, the national state takes up the legislative function and power well, the world state also will have to legislate. And nations would be, in that case, if it assumes all the legislative powers, well, nations would be like provinces of a nation or like states of the United States, the component states of the United States, you see. The world, world nations would be like that if legislative function was taken up by the world state. And... International idea also would grow perhaps, and to this growth, nationalism is a powerful obstacle. The idea that everything should be international and all nations must be equal and, you know, at peace and uh, in cooperation and so on. Well, the national idea again is, is one that can stand against it. And he points out that this is not merely a play of ideas. You should not think that only this is a question of which idea you will accept. Because... There are already forces at work. This is not to be decided merely on the plane of mind, an idea. And whether people like the idea or not, no, there are already forces at work which are going to play their part with the ideas. So he says that in the bringing about of the result of this, you know, action and reaction, forces are at work and not only ideas. And it is very possible that action of forces may bring about a change in the situation either in favor of world state or in the favor of world union, you see. The second factor, first national barriers are now weakening against science and thought and religious impulse. Secondly, economic life of the world is becoming one. So that they, these are the forces he's pointing out one by one. The forces that are making for weakening of national barriers and limitation of national consciousness and the forces that automatically therefore will support the bringing in of a world union whether of a state type or of a union type you see but the forces economic life of the world is becoming one and indivisible practically and uh, it is not as if the whole economic life had become unified and organized and rationalized 
because there are two contradictory forces at work even in this unification of economic life of the world. One force is that interdependence is there. Therefore, they want that there should be not only peace but some understanding between nations so that the economic life can go on with this interdependence, interchange. You know, more and more you maintain peace, easily you, you deal with others and, and uh, you know, be of service economically to each other. And by interdependence, economic life can develop. So there is interdependence. And secondly, there is also jealousy and a desire for separate existence and separate prosperity. A nation wants to depend on others also, but at the same time it knows that we must become prosperous. In, in fact, they are jealous also of the other nations. So the two forces which seem to be contradictory are at work. Major tendency being that the economic life is certainly tending to become more and more one and more and more indivisible. You will find at one stage it won't be possible to divide economic life of the world. That is going to come. But there are two forces at work and they militate against the, the, the coming in of the new era. If the world state would come into existence, it would first of all not allow this separate economic jealousy and a, a, a desire for prosperity to gain ground because it would first look to world interest. It would have first to consider the interest of the world, economic progress of the world and would not allow the two tendencies uh, to, to dominate the economic life of the world. And it can't allow the, the separate existence and uh, it can't have also the national, you know, attitude in economic life of separate prosperous existence and jealousy would not be allowed because if it is allowed, the whole economic life of the world would be wasteful, waste of time and energy. It would become, you know, overlapping over one another. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, too much production at one place and too much, uh, you know, want at another place. And it would become very irregular so far as the world economics was concerned. That is one. And uh, it would first look to the interest of the whole, whole mankind as a first interest. And it would have then automatically to create a united economic life for the whole human race. First, it would not allow the national you know, jealousies and selfishness to dictate anything in international life. It would first give priority to the progress of the world in economics. That's one. And secondly, in order to bring that progress in the world more and more, it would to take up the, the organization of economic life of the whole world. It will have to slowly come to that. And at present, nations are free in maintaining the internal order of their own, you know, states. Each nation is free. And crime also is a business that is, such, that is given over to the national state. But when this super state or the world state would come into existence, it would have to exercise some kind of international supervision over crime because crime is also international. There are branches of crime which are international. People doing one crime escape into another country. And uh, they, not only that, but gangs go on supporting, you know, the international criminal uh, uh, activity by escaping the, the jurisdiction of the nations. If a number of Frenchmen are settled here, well, the government here cannot do anything unless it is proved to the hilt, you see. And uh, they escape because they can keep the outer facade of the law and go on uh, doing their criminal activities. Well, this is uh, worldwide organizations for Iran and, uh, you know, uh, opium and uh, dangerous drugs and uh, even looting and uh, murder and so on are being uh, are carried on. And uh, nations are not enough to, there must be a supervisory international authority to track down crime, you see. And uh, then it would be not only supervision of crime and, uh, you know, in, on an international scale, but it would also have to take measures to prevent crime. Be before something happens, it must intervene and stop either a robbery or a murder or a sale of a big drug, you see, which is 
or large opium hall. <laughs> you see, it would have to stop that. Well, this thing it will have to do, not merely to supervise, but also to prevent crime. And it would have also to take up the moral training by taking up parts of education all over the world, perhaps. You see, training of the mind of man for world citizenship or thinking in terms of one world. It will have to train and educate people all over the world, either through nation agency or by directly preaching. You see, it will have to introduce something into each nation in order that the people who are national understand that they are part of an international, you know, organization. Thirdly, by eugenics, isolation of weak and uh, unfit and criminal persons and sterilization. You see, it, it would have to eliminate the undesirable element of mankind which cannot be prevented by any method but mechanical. This brings in the question of, you know, uh, of birth control. And we discussed partly that yesterday or day before, but uh, this question, really speaking, transfers the control of life from life impulses to collective mind. You see, up till now, the problem of population was left to work itself out on the basis of vital attraction and repulsion, vital urge of man's, uh, you know, vital life, life force. And life force was sufficient, regarded sufficient to regulate the whole process of, uh, you know, population or creation. Now, under present condition, you see, at uh, uh, one stage, it, it is also in a, another way, it marks the rise from mere vital level to intellectual or mental level in the process of control of sex energy. Sex energy now is not left free on its own level to, to you know, act as it likes. At one time, it was thought that automatic movement of the sex impulse like the the animal, you know, world in which the the population is automatically regulated by first men's dealing with the animal, then animals dealing among themselves, and uh, you know, I mean the the animals that prey on other animals, they they kill and keep the population under control in one way. You see, so that way as there is automatic control in nature, so it was automatic in human species also. But now the human species is moving, even as a collectivity, from pure vital life into mental life. And therefore, the power of creation or power of using sex energy for you know, procreation is being governed, not, not being allowed to govern by vital impulse, but by intellect and mind. You see? So that man is trying now to control the creation in one sense. He is rising to, and that is tallies completely with the position of the Gita, where the Purusha is the witness, one who gives the assent and consent. He is the supporter, he is the enjoyer, he is the lord, he is the dictator, he is the master. Well, the, the cosmic mind is coming to realize that partly, even in the plane of social life, even in the plane of social life, we are trying to come to a position where the collective mind is feeling the responsibility of population and uh, trying to dictate as to how the population, you know, the uh, uh, increase of population will be dealt with. This transfer from the mere vital to the mental is a, a phenomenon which is perhaps not noticed much by people who, who want to, that a whole control should be left to the vital as it was, you see. Now, there are also two schools so far as that is concerned. One school is to resort to mechanical and medical methods. And another school says that you must resort to psychological methods of self-control. Men like Gandhi, for instance, would always support that uh, sterilization by artificial means is not correct method of dealing with the problem. Or that uh, birth control is not the right method of, you know, controlling the, the population increase. The only method according to such thinkers or social workers is self-control. You see, not birth control, but self-control. So, to, according to the birth control or sterilization are too mechanical. Now, that does bring in a problem of man's psychology in, the, in our view. But here, the thinkers who advocate sterilizing and birth control are moved by collective vision. They are not moved by individual consideration. Their consideration is that if you leave it free, normally eight men out of ten 
are incapable of self-control. You see, they would say, uh, yes, you see, and how are you going, therefore, to, uh, to, to see that, uh, you see, if two people out of ten will exercise control, the result is a lessening of a higher population, perhaps. And uh, that is what happens in England, actually, that has happened. The middle class and the intelligentsia always exercise intellectual and conscious control, with the result that the labor population didn't care for it. Well, the result was the increase, such a vast increase of labor population of the lower strata of society that ultimately the whole society and culture would go down. You see, there is another danger. So the social thinkers who think in terms of, you know, the collectivity, their, con their contention is that so long as that is not done and man is not able to resist the attraction of his sex life, well, the only way is that either you sterilize or you have birth control. That is how they argue, you see, and between them it's difficult to make a decision. I think the best decision is to cultivate the mind of the masses to the need, if preferably of self-control, if in unable, well, the necessity of birth control. And uh, that even in country like India, where these things were regarded with a great, uh, you know, uh, traditional and, uh, and uh, outlook which would be called, you know, semi-moral or religious, even there, the villagers are actually taking to birth control. You will be surprised to know. But I know from my doctor friends who are practicing in the Mofusils, hundreds of people are going in for birth control because their economic life is such that if there is a large family, they cannot support it. Education apart, even pure support of the family is impossible if there is a lim no limit to the, to the family, you see. So, well, these are the two schools. We say one is control, trying to put in the idea of self-control and another strike with uh, sterilization birth control. Sri Arundhav here advocates eugenical methods because he feels that uh, criminal tendency can be transferred by, you know, heredity and it is better to prevent a bad, a bad heredity in human species. This he feels strong here. In this part of his writing, he is almost positive about criminal tendency being inherited by the future generation without their responsibility. I mean, they would be not responsible for the tendency. Probably it would come her through heredity. The jail system or the imprisonment system should become more humanized. That is the fourth, third thing that the world state, you know, world state would do. And fourthly, bring about a judicial, judicial, judicial system with general standards of justice all over the world. In one country, one thing is regarded as very criminal. In another country, well, the man gets off, you see. Mm -hmm. So in France, if there is a, you know, a woman has murdered the, somebody who was in love with, uh, with uh, her husband, well, the French jury will say, oh, the crime passionate, oh, say, it is, a, you know, it is excusable, that's all right. Now, in another country, if you go, even for, for something, the man will be hanged. <laughs> So there is a, not a one, one standard of justice prevailing. So you say that um, a system of general standard in justice all over the world, as near as possible, not uniform, but yet the standards must not vary too much, you see. Now, it is supposed that the world state would not generally interfere in the affair, internal affairs of each nation which constitutes the world state. Now, it would not generally interfere because a interference would require, again, a machinery of interference. But uh, if there is a crisis in a nation, there will always be a chance for interference because it can always argue that, you see, the maintenance of peace is necessary for maintenance of the world state, is it not? <laughs> that, that would become necessary argument in its favor and it would say that uh, it would normally not interfere and he gives the instance of United States interference in Cuba. You see, that uh, it could interfere just as a big state interferes in a, in a small state, the world state would do the same. You see, For liberty's sake or for Greece, for instance, during the war time the Allies had to occupy Greece, isn't it? During war time the Allies had to occupy Greece. The, the freedom of Greece was not allowed. So, well, they can always say the race has a common interest in the internal affairs of every nation. 
the whole race has a common interest in the internal affairs of a race, of a nation. And uh, with that, uh, you know, I mean, principle or idea, it can always interfere in the internal affairs of a state, of a nation. And that idea may gain, gain ground. Centralization and uniformity would go together thus. And uh, cultural differences would tend to diminish all over the world. Differences in cultural standard. And uh, that would perhaps lead to the rise of a common world culture. A world culture would be perhaps uh, coming in the wake of the organization of the world state. Even cosmopolitan socialism may come. Not socialism of a nation, but cosmopolitan socialism. Everywhere, so all international socialism, he calls it cosmopolitan. And there might be even insistence in evolving a one language for all, you see. As Esperanto, once they tried, they gave it up. But there are some people who still stick on, <laughs> you know. There is a dictionary of Esperanto and all kinds of, you know. Well, it can come if the world state becomes central, so centralized and uniform. Now, in the next... It is 27th chapter, is it? Huh? Yes. yes, 27th chapter, he deals with the perils of the world state. So he points out that if such a state is organized, military, administrative, economic, and in all respects, that would be its character and that is how it will evolve. Now in this 27th, he is dealing with the perils of the world state. What are the dangers? You see? This world state idea, in fact, he says, represents the modern mind at the highest point of its self-consciousness. There is no doubt it is the highest concept to which human mind could go in organization of outer collective life. And therefore, it represents the modern mind at its highest point of self-consciousness. And therefore, it should not be considered as utopia, something that is impossible. In fact, it is becoming inevitable outcome of the urge towards human unity. It is going to become inevitable in the sense that the whole tend is to create unity of mankind. And either this way or that way, it may not be state way, but it, it is there. <clears throat> now, if the state principle is admitted in the organization of this human unity, then uniformity, regulation, mechanization, and uh, you know, centralization must come. That would be its logical end, he says. That would come, whether in beginning it is there or not. In the beginning there will be only prevention of war, but ultimately it will tend to create that situation in which everything is centralized, uniform, regulated, and mechanical. Perhaps socialism, as he said, would be its end. In Asia, one particular phenomenon is that there are not that kind of organized nations, but there are peoples. You see, he makes a distinction between peoples and nations. Nations have a more organized or more conscious political and economic existence, while peoples have a more social and, you can say, ethical or religious or some sort of other values which puts them together. Some common acceptance of ideas and ideals, you see, that makes the people. So he says, in Asia there are not so many peoples as, not nations as peoples. And if all mankind, means all the nations of mankind can preserve that instinct of the people, then a single human people also, with free association of the units, is possible. That can come about. Here, complete uh, centralization is one peril, one danger. Interference in nation, also a possible interference second. Tyranny of the whole over self-hypnotized, of the self-hypnotized mass over its constituent unit is quite possible. That the whole international group would not tyrannize over one or two nations is not inconceivable. Because if you see a nation that has dictatorial power or has a state socialism, it does not hesitate to, to crush the, the freedom of the groups. It was illustrated in Russia. You see, in Russia, the, the, what he calls here the tyranny of the whole, or 
self hypnotized mass whole mass can always you know tyrannize over the constituent groups that's what they did in ukraine and white russia and all the parts that were not falling in line with the russian line of you know thinking or along along uh, I mean, uh, socialistic lines or communistic lines and uh, so it happened in italy also the same thing happened in italy in italy in the, the fascist regime well the whole uh, did uh, you know crush down the freedom of the of the, of the, the groups so that can happen in the world state and uh, union that might come about and to say that democracy is a guarantee for individual liberty is not right goes uh, um, when a monarch or a absolute power you know dictator takes away power the injustice is flagrant and immediately seen but in democracy when uh, when freedom is taken away the individual is more helpless because the argument is that it's democracy and democracy can do it more effectively absolutely more effectively so democracy is not a guarantee against uh, you know uh, taking away the liberty of the individual and uh, such a state would have to give at least if it is democratic freedom of speech freedom of thought and freedom of association and what it would do in that case is to control the freedom of thought it would try to control education it would try to control education indoctrinate the younger generation with its uh, idea so that when they come to think they, they will think only what the state wanted them to think it doesn't last for very long you see it can last for 20 25 or one generation i mean 25 years or one generation but can't last forever it didn't last in russia <laughs> you see they try to put down books that wrote uh, something which would mean you know ultimately against communism or something that did not agree with communistic ideology well those books were banned and people were you know books were not allowed to sell in fact i think somebody who wrote about evolution was not allowed to to sell his books uh, see that became a public case and so on it came out in international uh, literary world now there the the, the I- ideas of the writer were not in keeping with the ideology of the communist state you see now that is what might happen he says that in order to control the thought they might control the education but even after education the human individual might might revolt because uh, you cannot uh, hypnotize the the individual for all time yes for some time 20 years but 50, 30 years it can submit and then afterwards the individual will find out and there will be outside public also one reason was the outside world was there which was all the time uh, you know giving its free opinion about whatever russia was doing <laughs> and those people are bound to know that certain people who have intellectual probity or honesty are are thinking along different lines so then naturally they will also have to think that is how stalinism had to be given up you see it had to take such a long time but ultimately stalinism had to be given up the the, the you know, apotheosis of a leader of a nation by absolute rule and tyranny well that that had to be given up how many people went uh, went to gallows for that so many people were shot is it not i mean one by one the leaders of each party was a different was got rid of simply because they didn't want any difference any opposition the 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 steam roller must go on that was the idea well steam roller did go on for 30 years and then afterwards people who were crushed under it and who escaped something of it had to say well this is not uh, not quite right <laughs> Come in. <laughs> Come in. <laughs> Sit down. Come here. There is seat here. All along. <laughs> so yeah, we are discussing about the perils of the world state. We are going through ideal of human unity, and we have covered about twenty-seven, eight chapters. So we are going in for this uh, idea of perils of the world state and. Uh, three or four perils have been already counted and we are coming to the end of that uh, idea where the freedom of speech freedom of association and freedom of thought will be given if there is a democratic constitution but given even the freedom of speech thought and association the state can always dictate the thought 
थ्रू कंट्रोल ऑफ एजुकेशन एंड ट्रेनिंग यू सी बाई क्रिएटिंग कल्चरल वैल्यूज फेवरेबल टू इट्स ओन आउटलुक एंड दैट इज वॉट वी कैन डू even if somebody escape this dictatorial you know dictation of thought through indoctrination by education an individual can rise and, and revolt in that case he will be an anarchist isn't he he will plead only anarchism because now the highest organized state is the, the socialist state or communist state i mean the one in which every every activity of the individual is dictated by the wisdom collectivity and you know the knowledge and plan of the whole state state is working out everything for the individual individual is not allowed so much to think and bother about him because everything is thought out for him well in that case when he find that the thought and indoctrination is not convincing he will rise in revolt and say no state is required that will be the logical outcome of human thought would a state allow that is a problem would a state would say that now state must be liquidated isn't it well that would be the result of freedom of thought first the freedom would be restricted by control of education and indoctrination but if that didn't work and somebody said well state is not necessary what would the state do would it allow this freedom of thought so he puts a question and says so you to answer this question if you want to go in two points he is making out that the union of human race has become a practical necessity and there are two possible you know forms which it is likely to take that's what we have studied from 24th chapter right up to now world state or a organic union of world people you see now yes that's it that's where we are and uh, he has shown military centralization administrative centralization legislative centralization and economic centralization how far it will uh, organize itself and what are the possibilities of such an organization and what would be its repercussions upon the national life of constituent you know elements of that world union and he has shown that there would be even interference in the nation uh, in the internal life of the race of the of the nation it could also uh, do many things which we have already gone through and now in the 28th chapter he takes up the problem of diversity in oneness or uniformity unity diversity in unity diversity in oneness now he says that unity is an idea which is not at all unreal or arbitrary unity is necessary when we plead for and try to do arguments about the world state and its organization we do not say that because there are dangers let us not have unity no, that is not the point point is unity is essential in fact idea of unity is not at all arbitrary for unity is the very basis of existence without unity there will be no life all life is based on unity you will go back to the past i mean to the lower strata of creation or the whole cosmos and you will see that the whole creation there is based upon something that is a unifying element element of life in the vegetable kingdom element of life in the insect and the and the animal kingdom vegetable kingdom matter itself you find a unifying element of energy pervading everything so unity is the basis of existence but then uniformity is not the law of life unity is the basis of life but uniformity is not the law of life life exists by diversity in fact life does not exist only by unity life is based on unity but it continues its existence by diversity differentiation variation a necessary change in the form and functioning it insists that everything even while one with all in its universality shall by some variation become unique and that is the working out as we saw from life divine study when we finished that study the coming down of the, the it is really the practical application of You see, the manifestation takes place of an omnipresent reality, which is triple, which is not divided into three. It takes three positions. It is triple. 
it is uh, it is seen in three stations or three statuses of itself the transcendent the universal and the individual this is one this is not to be considered as if there were three this makes the whole process of creation or the movement that we see as the world or universe so in it there will always be an insistence on creation of the individual uniqueness in the whole process of universal creation there is no repetition there is no coming to an end of the power of variation and creativity infinite power of self determination each determination because it is of the absolute because it's a determination of the divine because it's a determination of the supreme because it's a determination of infinite consciousness existence and bliss each is unique there is never a necessity to say oh it must be repeated or now the variation has come to an end and everything must become uniform two leaves of the tree are not the same uniqueness is driven to such an extent in the constitution of the cosmos that two leaves even of a same tree have not the same outer form it always differs this uniqueness you see is the basis of individuality and it is that which makes well you call it uh, there is no 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 creation without that the uniqueness is necessary order is the law of life for instance the, those who plead for uniformity always say that but we are doing it out of for this need of order now order is indeed law of life but not over centralization make a distinction that is called thinking you see that is called a seer who points out uh, you know and <laughs> can um, has split and yet point out something which is absolutely fundamental all the world over they are saying about unity and uniformity and order order yes order is all right but not over centralization one and not artificial regulation you see there should not be any artificial regulation it is just like a gardener who takes hold of his garden and says now this must be the pattern design well it is it fulfills his mental idea of what is uniformity an order is created which is no fulfillment of the plant life order is there order nobody says that it is not order but it is not real order from point of view of sir bindu because it is it is unnatural isn't it i mean <laughs> artificial regulation it's not a, not an order that comes from within he artificially cuts the plant into a size of a square or an oblong or a circle or an animal or whatever he likes and he thinks it is very fine because his sense of order is satisfied there but that sense of order satisfied by creating a uniformity outside of an artificial regularity does not become the fulfillment of the plant or the tree and the problem is how to create the fulfillment of the plant and the tree so there you see therefore order is all right but artificial or over centralization and artificial regulation has to be avoided and kept out sound order is that which comes from within as the result of a nature that has discovered and found its own law it find this is my law of development and it follows that that order is correct order therefore the truest order is that which is founded on the greatest possible liberty truest order is that which is founded on the greatest possible liberty it is on this that education in pondicherry is founded you see it shouldn't impose from outside but allow the order to come from inside yes greatest possible liberty for liberty is at once the condition of vigorous variation if you give liberty people will not agree and become uniform each will try and trend to become unique which is necessary yes is a condition of vigorous variation and the condition of self finding he cannot find himself unless he is left free so a vigorous variation and self finding can only come if full freedom is given liberty is given to the individual and that would create the true order free grouping is necessary for unity of the race therefore 
if you create the unity of human race, then a free grouping of peoples is necessary, not a compulsory or imposed order. That's, that's what is implied, you see. And a group must have natural, like, must be like the natural association of individuals. Then group of the collective, you know, nationhood or the whole unity of mankind when you bring into existence must be like the natural association of individuals. Just as individuals naturally come together in a group life, well, the nations must come together in the human unity. That should be, that is the natural order. You see, that would be something that comes from inside. For instance, there is diversity of language. Now, would you want to say that because we want human unity of mankind or unity of race, therefore diversity of language should be got rid of? Cannot do that. He's just pointing out one element to show how diversity is a necessary element of enrichment. In fact, it is, it is life, he says, you see. Well, diversity of language serves two purposes, in fact. First, unification. The nation in which one language is spoken is united because of language, yes. And use of variation, and that variation is necessary for the, for the whole. It brings people together intellectually, aesthetically, in its expressive capacities, and strengthens the unity. And it's a means for national differentiation. It's a helpful differentiation. It is healthy and helpful differentiation. One nation expressing itself in one language because the genius of the people finds expression in the language. And it is, it is necessary for its own self-expression. And that variation of self-expression is necessary because it adds a, a color and a charm and a, and a contribution, in fact, which, which other people cannot do. I mean, you take only prose writing apart from anything else. You see, the, the French prose, if you study French, you will see that, that that is something which French mind alone can do that way. You take poetry and you read English language, you find, yes, that's the genius, find the best expression in that language. You will find the variation of this language uh, itself an element of aesthetic enjoyment, uh, in its power of expression which brings that such a possibility of the human spirit of saying the same thing so differently, so well, perhaps so better, uh, does exist. You, you, you're surprised to know that when you study carefully the expression of the racial genius through language, through literature, through thought, through aesthetic creations, you see, artistic arts and poetry and so on. Well, we, how the same idea finds expression, surprising nice. And that is a, a source of a greater enjoyment because it's a, a coming of delight in a form uh, which may be the, the, the origin may be the same or the nature is the same, but the form is so different that you enjoy it for the uniqueness of the form. You don't care for the unity of the substances all, the, all over. Perhaps somebody will say there is nothing new in the, under the sun. And yet every day everything is new under the sun. <laughs> every day everything is new under the sun, you see. So you find that most uh, remarkable thing in, in, uh, in the expression of the racial genius in uh, the medium of the language. And he says that that's a variation which is necessary in human unity should not think that if languages are not one, we cannot become one. <laughs> Langu ah, that's, that's the point he is driving. For each language is a sign and power of the soul of the people, which naturally speaks it, and each develops its own spirit and thought temperament in the language. Therefore, it is of utmost value to a nation, to a group soul, to preserve its language, to make of it a strong and living cultural instrument. A nation or a race or a people which loses its language cannot live its whole life or its real life even. And this, advant this is an advant this advantage is to its own life at the same time an advantage to the general life of human race. It is not merely that it is advantageous to the, to the, to the race, you see, which speaks the language. And then he gives an instance of how this language, you know, plays a part in, in, the, in the unit committee of nations. He says the British Empire, you take colonies. 
they don't count much in the culture of the world because they have no native culture and because their speech, the fact of their speech, well, they are always regarded and have been acting up till now, at least as provinces of England. That was true of even the United States till yesterday. But nobody in Europe at any rate, here whatever might have been, thought seriously of the literary and cultural contribution of America through language. Through political, economic and international life is quite different. But in language, in thought, well, except he says two or three big figures, it was always a province of some other culture. which So language plays such an important part in the expression of the racial soul. Modern India is another striking example, you see. Nothing has more uh, successfully prevented her self-finding and development under modern conditions than the overshadowing of Indian languages and as a cultural instrument by the English language. That is true. Till yesterday, the Indian, you know, 14 languages were almost, you know, under the, under a sort of a, ban in which they couldn't uh, progress and develop, you know. What developed was in spite of the pressure. If a Tagore came and if Bengali literature became up to date or Gujarati literature became up to date, it was because some great fellow came and broke the bondage, you see, and refused to go uh, admit the, the enslavement of the, the foreign instrument and refused even to use English. Gandhi on the side of Western India never wrote to any Indian in any other language but Indian, either it was Hindi or Gujarati, never wrote in English. For some, I don't say it is wonderful good, but uh, it was necessary. I mean, it points out the, the situation of the time. Tagore never wrote to anybody in India except in, in Bengali language. If he was a Bengali, always in Bengali, never wrote in English. They had to make rules because the domination was such that your language is on, not fit. Now, they are not fit, some of them, because of that very depression. If they have been allowed to develop, they would have certainly come up to date, at least become much better than they are now. And it is because some genius or some people took up the, the, the racial, you know, genius into their own mind and decided to express everything in their language that you have some literary efflorescence which is really unique. And we would have lost it if they had not expressed. If Tagore didn't write in Bengali, you wouldn't have the, 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 the contribution that is in the for the world. Because he couldn't have written that in English. You simply compare Gitanjali in English and Bengali and you will see the difference. Absolutely, you cannot say that it is the same. Central core he has given, the idea he has given, but it's in art it is the form that is almost 90% of the thing, you see. And uh, you, you cannot make that same thing, no. It is, English Gitanjali is a good rendering, new substance. Right? Artistic form is not there, you cannot say. But the same thing for everybody. It, it doesn't mean that therefore you must become, you know, people blinded by linguistic pride or egoism which is happening in some parts of India even now, you see, that some parts are taking up cudgels against other part on the basis of language, as if language was not, only, not a unifying force but a dividing force, so you see, you can, human egoism is such a collective ego that it can take up any good cause and spoil it, you see, and that is what has happened to this linguistic, uh, you know, this, um, uh, I mean, uh, quarrel in India, for the matter of that, there are people pulling one side for Hindu, another pulling for another side, and so on. And uh, <laughs> controversial language, you see. But he points out that this variation is a necessary element and it should be preserved even in the interest of human unity itself, because it's a contribution to man's progress. Language is a sign of the cultural life of a people and the index of its soul in thought and mind that stands behind and enriches its uh, soul in action also. Diversity of language is worth keeping because diversity of culture and differentiation of soul groups are worth keeping and because without that diversity of life cannot have full play. You will prevent the play of life force and play of creativity. The outward life requires unification. But inner life requires variation. Not a uniform unity, not a logically simple or scientifically rigid unity, or a beautifully neat and mechanical sameness, but 
a living oneness full of healthy freedom and variation is the ideal which we have to keep in mind if you want to bring a living unity of mankind into being. This almost verbatim, I think, almost is words. I don't know because I took it long ago. A, a common Swiss culture does not exist today. In case of a common language, there is no such principle. But individual language should cease and nations may become, if, if they cease, the nations will simply become geographical provinces of a mere simple state. And that's a consummation which you do not think is the realization of human unity. Separation of language would not be a necessary element uh, for human unity. Shall I take up the next chapter, idea of the League of Nations? I don't know, it is past 11, so perhaps we'll take it next time. Hmm? All right. Cesar, the comes out. A word that you said that outward life verification and inner life unity is that last word? Variation. Uni unity. Uh, uh, outward life. Requires unification or uniformity. Unif uniformity. Oh, inner life requires Yes, inner life requires variation. A free variation is necessary for inner life. Sages of India are all very unique in their own way, and yet mm. there is a like, solid truth to it, but they all present it in a very unique yes, way. Yes, yes. Their lives are well. different from one another. In other words, you don't imitate their outer life. Yes. Uh, doesn't the outer life though, also require diversification of the way people dress and what they eat? And outer life required? Diversification or variation uh, rather than uniformity in terms of dress and food and... Yes, and, uh, yes, all that applies because that would be an expression of inner life, really speaking. When he speaks of outer life, he means economics, politics, uh, that, that, that is the organization of collective life. Right. Yes, yes. Well, I think the distinction between yes. collective uh, and individual. Yes. Well, there also the variation is very necessary. And uh, I don't know why people uh, do not realize the value of variation in the outer expression of their, their national genius. Why, for example, do even the Buddhist monks or any uh, religious group always insist on the same clothing, the same food, and uh, everything the same? So, yeah, that is to mark them out separately from the social, you know, order. To, to mark them out as if they are dedicated to one cause and so on. That any, wherever your group life is dedicated to a cause, takes place. And outer uniformity to impress and to discipline also, that is disciplining themselves and also in get, getting the impression to the outside people of the character of their group making, you see, either religious or political or military or uh, social and so on. And to make them completely equal. Yeah. Yes, make not necessarily equal, but uh, uh, mark them out as a group in a, in a larger collectivity, a smaller entity in a bigger collectivity. I think that's desirable and... Uh... In actual life or any other? Well, uh, it, it should be voluntary, if at all allowed in a collective life of a spiritual center, it should be voluntary. It should not be an imposition from outside. Okay. Uh, this, uh, idea of uniformity, I won't say a problem, because uh, the way I want to put my question, which is rather ambiguous in my own mind, I can't say it's a problem. Because if the spirit inhabits the form, you'll say, in a large mm -hmm. measure, in a collective sense, the spirit inhabits, inhabits the form, you'll say, in the, take example, in modern art. If, if modern art, if, if modern art form is abstraction, is there for a purpose. Spirit is utilizing, and say, that form, no matter how imperfect it may be in the hands of most individuals, uh, it is very well handled in the hands of great individuals who you know how to handle it. And uh, is a breaking away of old art forms. And when the spirit has utilized that, that form to its fullest advantage, you believe it. Well, how are we to distinguish? 
between uh, means the vital intelligence, I mean, an universal consciousness inhabiting the corn, as they, and a man made uniformity. For instance, you no, you see, the thing is this, uh, all ideas which man gets, intellectual ideas, your question is, you want to feel the difference between or see the difference between the working of the group consciousness and the idea which the individual gets about the group consciousness and its working, is it not? Something of that type, yes. Now, whatever idea the individual gets is really the working of the collective consciousness. The difficulty comes in when passing through the individual's mental consciousness or mental atmosphere, it takes up a form. And that form gives it automatically a limitation. Take communism for the matter of that. Now, there is a great truth behind communism. Not as preached by somebody who made a theory of communism, you know, so yes. But if you go behind, it is equality of soul, and in fact, it is sameness of the divine in each. Not only equality of soul, but one divinity in all, and one equal divinity in all. That is the basis. It is from that now, from the collective life, the collective consciousness, the universal consciousness feels or felt that this impulse or this working was necessary for social reconstruction. So, world idea or world force, when people are trying to find, what should we do? Now, capitalism is doing this, this is injustice, one man is earning a lot, all the laborers are doing and getting nothing, and so on. When the fermentation is going on, the idea from above tries to come down and say, no, all are equal and all are equally divine. Now, that is what it wanted to carry out in life. Now, how to carry this out in life when somebody received it, call him Lenin or Marx or X or Y or Z, whoever received it, because that individual is very keen and feels this problem very keenly, he alone generally will open to that, you see, because that also is trying to find a place find a medium for its expression here. So, such a medium naturally becomes automatically available to it and it comes down. Unfortunate situation in human life is that man being ignorant and egoistic, moved by his ego sense, he gives it a form when it comes down, which becomes limited. It has its effectivity because the charge behind it is something cosmic, therefore it, it has a push, it works. But immediately after some time it comes and you realize that it is not what it should have been. You know that, oh, there is something wrong. But something wrong was not in the original impulse, but in the formulation of the scheme or idea or the philosophy or idealism. You see, now in order to do that, they evolved a technique. First, that society must always be divided into capitalism and labor. This was not necessary. This was not the original idea there. Class war must be inevitable. This is not there. This, you see, then you must get to power somehow or other. Then you must create dissatisfaction. Who, where is that? You understand my point? Yes. You must make class fight with another class. The more poor people are, the better it is for you, because you will get at the power. If you have got the power, then you will be able to bring about this unity, but then you will bring about not some the unity of the inner being, but some imposed unity. Well, it will become dictation, then dictation, then it will become arbitrary power, and then it will become tyranny. Well, that's what it became. It becomes like that. This is how the, the original truth gets, you know, deformed and misapplied in life and, well, creates problems here. But the, through that, something is done. I don't say that that's all waste. Something is done because the gross injustice to the large mass of labor is brought to notice of the whole world. And even the capitalist world is not now capitalist. You see, it is wrong to say there is a capitalist world. There is really speaking not that capitalism which was in the Victorian times. If one studies carefully, capitalism has undergone such a change that you can't now call it that capitalism. <laughs> it is much change. I don't say that all its evils are set right or that uh, it is a wonderful system. No. 
But apart from that, the, the impact of this has been felt, what I mean is. You see, the impact of this outlook is felt all over. <clears throat> Even in countries which have not accepted the ideology of socialism or communism. So the same in art. The impulse is to create something new. And get out of the classical mold, that's all. The, 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 what the artists were doing before, they say we want to create from inside. Former artists were looking to outside, now we want to create from inside. From where? So somebody said sensation. Quite right. You attended my lecture there. Yes, so somebody said impression. The fourth said uh, cubism, means it's a mental imposition of a form from the mind. Cubes don't exist, but cubes exist here, and you want to impose those cubes from... We want to create from inside. That was the, the basic movement. There is Sriyarunda would say perfectly right. Now, which inside? Because there is number of stages, number of step cases, staircases. And you can go to this, or you can go to that, or you can go to that. Now, which inside? You can go down. There is a ladder which will lead you down. So if you go down, you can also say, well, this is from inside, but which inside? It can be from the drain. You see, you can just say, uh, yes, it is, it is, it is uh, from inside, but inside it can be from the drain. So, therefore he pleads that, no, when you go inside, then try to go to the true center, your psychic being, your soul. Don't try to go to your vital. You may do great things and vital things if you go to the right even vital center because vital is creative and a very powerful instrument of expression. But uh, that would be also a creation and very good creation. But if you want truly to create, I mean from inside, the best is to retire into the psychic being, the soul, and take the inspiration from there and create. Then you will see that it is not from below or horizontal level, but from above that you have to bring down art. Then you have to rise to a plane of intuition, a plane of inspiration, or a self-existent plane of harmony which already exists. And contact that plane and make an opening in your consciousness to that plane. Or call down that plane to come down into you. Then what you create will be truly something from inside, you see. It may be an abstract form, it may be concrete form, it may be anything. But that will be worth you know, creating in the world of art, because that would be really harmony and beauty brought into this world. Not an effort to, to be new, and because it is new, therefore it's genius, and it is marvelous because it is not common, and because uh, nobody did it before, therefore it is uh, wonderful. All those common ideas which are prevalent in every young boy like David coming and painting something and saying this is a work of art, well, it's all right, he can satisfy himself. The world of art is impersonal. There is a perception in man, and the perceived perceptive capacity, capacity or faculty of man must appreciate it also. If art is communication, then one has to uh, to to see whether he is able to communicate or whether there is anything worth communicating. Simply because the form is new, it is not aesthetically justifiable. No, not at all. That is the trouble with all arts, not only uh, the outer. All arts are in. Now in a cold on because there is such an upsetting of values of aesthetic as, you know, enjoyment now that everything is upset and that will sometime it will be like that. The, uh, well, the highest fulfillment of arts, but the various arts, uh, mm -hmm. the highest fulfillment of the arts. Well, to create divine beauty, to, to bring down divine beauty on earth. Uh, can you picture it uh, through the integration of the arts, uh, music, dance? It depends. Each art has its own fulfillment, you see, because each art takes up a different medium. And uh, the, the expression of the art will be through the medium. So it will have to conform to the technique of the medium also. You see, yeah. it, the same thing expressing itself in stone will not be the same as expressing itself in color or expressing itself in poetry, or expressing itself in, in dance, you see. Can, we, can they be integrated together, though, into a, a kind of... Um... Oh, well, as yet there is no... Uh, human being hasn't got such a versatility as to uh, equally command all the instruments of, you know, or media of, of self-expression. 
even I think the yeah, one of the rare geniuses like that, Leonardo da Vinci, for instance, you see. Now you can find that uh, there was something that uh, went into science and went into mathematics, went into, went into painting, went into something else and so on and created something. But uh, even then perhaps one would have always a limitation because human being generally has a formulation of nature in which certain faculties are more developed automatically by past evolution or by choice uh, than other faculties and uh, an integration of art for the sake of artistic expression doesn't come to an artist easily because the medium which is his is, is, in, is so much absorbed in it that he cannot put himself out and, and think of something else, you see. The medium so much is his own, you know, the way in which it comes down is, is so spontaneous that for anything else he would have to make a very tremendous effort. And if he, unless he happens to be versatile like Shervindo, but you can't take Shervindo as an example. And the common man, he's out uh, or concour, as they say. <laughs> Plowing up the whole forms in all the different um, arts now, in music as well as in painting. Yes. This new, uh, it's really in the process now, isn't it? Yes, yes, that is a, it is transitional state through which we are passing, yes. Yeah. For all arts, in all arts. I hope they are. <laughs> I hope they would be conscious about it. They will get it immediately if they are conscious. Because uh, the, the consciousness is not, uh, uh, not absent, but uh, whether they are ready. They are so self-satisfied and self-complacent, self, self most of the artists, that they never think of anything else but their little self. And that is the whole obstacle. The moment they think that we want to get something you know, from a higher source, or we have a higher center available to us, they will immediately get it. And there are some artists who can create like that, but very few. You can count their own fingers and... <laughs> I suppose you've heard of the term cosmic art, which has been applied to this type of artistry, uh, of the art of the future, and from the higher... Who, Dr. Well, the cosmic art. By Dr. Uh, Piper? Well, no. there is a book by, yes, that he wrote. He's writing. Uh, no. He is writing, yes. Yes, he's, he's completing the book. I think he's writing the preface. Um, I know him. He read The Hungry Eye that he wrote. Yes, that. I know. I have. So you are aware that there is this, uh, throughout the world, there are there is an artist here and there who is tuning in and already beginning to... Yes, uh, yeah, but that concept of cosmic art is that all over the world, a artistic impulse is at work. That is the basic idea. That is true. There is a fundamental truth behind it. That art is a cosmic, you know, I mean, expression. Expression which takes place in different, you know, mediums and different places, but it's a common impulse. And I think that is a, almost uh, axiomatically true, I think. When will this book be out, brother? I think it must be very ready almost, because he said he was writing the preface. So I think it must be almost the end of it. <laughs> it has taken him long years, <laughs> 16 years. <laughs> yes, 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 I've seen his paintings, I've seen his paintings. They are quite a class, a nice painting so far as the mountain scenery is concerned and the use of color. Wide patches of color and transparency of color. Reflection of light and transparency of color and rendering of mountain as a conscious thing is a special contribution of Rorik. What do you think of his teachings? I don't know his teachings. Oh, you don't? He was for world union, that I know, that much only. National unity of mankind. That was one of the things he stood for. I saw him once in Pondicherry, but didn't meet him. 